Okay, thanks everyone for tuning in. That's going right there. Is everyone getting the screen? Chris, can you just give me a thumbs up if it's good to go? And while you're doing that, Michael, just want to say we're already 90, 90 people listening to you tonight, just to keep the pressure on. There we go. Are we all good now? I think my, she yeah, my screen shared there. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in and thanks Chris for hosting this uh, evening. Um, so as you know, I'll be talking about Angola and Chris mentioned that I first went in 2003 bird watching with uh, friends, Callan Cohen and Claire Spotterswood. And at that stage, I realized that something really, really needed to be done in terms of conservation in the country. Um, there were great threats and, and not much being done. So uh, I got involved. Um, and this evening I'll be talking mostly about my own experiences, but also trying to give you a broad overview of Angola, um, which not many people have had the opportunity to visit yet. So just a brief overview of the presentation. First, I'll highlight some general key features of Angola, then talk about the physical template, the, vari uh, the variation of physical template which drives the biodiversity of Angola. Um, just highlight some of the key ecoregions and plant communities, and then I'll move on to my own area of expertise, which is birds um, and bird diversity in Angola. Um, and then I'll end off more on a conservation note, looking at a few of the projects that have been ongoing in Angola, um, what the main threats are, and talk about my own work that's been happening for the last 10 to 15 years. Okay, so this is a map of Angola. Angola is almost exactly the same size as South Africa. Uh, 1.25 million square kilometers, but it has a smaller population. 33 million people. Um, unfortunately, most of the people are situated in the west of the country where the greater biodiversity. So there's a very complex between 16 and 18 degrees south. So it was a Portuguese colony historically, um, and it gained independence uh, in the early 1970s, but unfortunately that led to a protracted civil war, which lasted about 30 years. And that affected obviously all of society, but um, it had a big impact on biodiversity conservation and also um, biodiversity research. So there's a big gap in our knowledge in Angolan biodiversity associated with the war. Uh, and then a, another key thing just to mention is that industrially Angola is very heavily dependent on oil. Uh, 10 years ago, 95% of its foreign revenue was earned from oil. Um, so at the moment, the country is suffering. You all know what's been happening to the oil price. Um, okay, so Moving on to the physical template, um, I've drawn very much from this book, Biodiversity of Angola, which is available free as a PDF online, um, edited by Brian Huntley and uh, a few other people. Um, and so th these uh, maps come from this book. I I'm no expert on soil, but uh, what this map illustrates uh, quite nicely is that the eastern half of the country is all fairly uniform. It's Kalahari, deep Kalahari sands, um, and it's the western half of the country that's much more interesting, even from a soil perspective. And this is the underlying template on which biodiversity, to which biodiversity responds. Um, then moving on to altitude and landforms. This is a, a map of altitude. And there are basically four important regions in terms of altitude. Um, firstly, there's a coastal strip, which uh, runs the entire length of the country on the west coast. Uh, between zero and 300 meters altitude. The main feature of the country highway is the inland plateau. So from the coastal strip, it rises quite steeply up to generally around a thousand meters and almost the entire country uh, is at that altitudinal range, a uh, thousand meters and above. So a coastal strip and inland plateau. And then the red areas on the map show the highland areas, which are one of the most unique elements of the country. 
Um, these highland areas uh, have what we call Afro-Montane elements. They are related to other African montane areas, but all of these areas are more than 2,000 kilometers away from the Angolan uh, montane elements. And the important thing in, for Angola, besides its isolation, is that it's, it also has the smallest remnants of the Afro-Montane biome in, Af uh, well, in Africa. Um, and then the third, uh, the, sorry, the fourth feature, which is very hard to see on this map, and it's really a transition zone, is the interface between the plateau and, and the coastal zone. And that is the escarpment, um, which has a massive impact on the biodiversity of Angola. And it runs all the way from uh, the north down at least as far south as Lubango. Um, and it's this interface, which I'll talk about uh, a bit later in terms of uh, important endemic biodiversity. Then rainfall, um, most of the country has quite high rainfall all over the plateau. It generally, except in the far south, you're looking at above a thousand meters altitude. Uh, the coast on the other hand is arid. Um, and that's in, in fact almost the entire length of the coast. Even up in Luanda, which is quite far north, you're looking at uh, less than 400, 300 millimeters of rain. The southwest, very arid, uh, an extension of, of the Namib Desert. Um, and obviously this is important in terms of river drainages. The Angolan Highlands produce, or the rainfall of the, in the Angolan Highlands feed a lot of very big river systems in Africa. Um, a lot of the upper Zambezi, uh, almost the entire Okavango's uh, water comes from Angola, the Kunene River, and then parts of the Congo. But there are also a few rivers which rise in Angola and flow west out um, to the coast, the most important of those of which is the Kwanzaa River. Uh, it rises in the Angolan Highlands and flows west out to south of Luanda. Uh, so the, those are the most important features of the, of the physical template uh, on which to which biodiversity responds. And the next level up is plants, which is also not an area of, my, uh, an area of expertise of mine, but Angola has a tremendous diversity in, in plant communities, all the way from Cabinda up in the north, where you have true Congo Basin forests, um, tall tropical forests, and all the way down to the driest desert on the continent, the Namib Desert. And I don't think there's any other country in Africa which displays such an extreme range of habitats. Most of the country, especially on the plateau, is covered in Miombo woodlands, so very vast Miombo woodlands, including uh, some of the most extensive tracts of, of primary woodland uh, left in Africa. Um, but, and then in the, in the southeast, generally more arid savanna woodland uh, type habitat. And I'm just going to share a few photographs from around Angola, depicting some of the landscapes and habitats. This is in the southwest in Iona National Park on the edge of the, the Namib Desert in the rocky areas. Sorry. Um, this is uh, the southern escarpment uh, near Lubango, the top of Leba Pass, uh, a very impressive escarpment which rises a thousand meters in altitude over about five or six kilometers. This is also down in Iona National Park uh, in the intermontane valleys. You get these acacia areolobia savannas with uh, obviously very arid, short grassland. Along the coastal plain, uh, there's some very impressive baobab forests. Probably, uh, I've never seen anything like it anywhere else in Africa. Um, and a very thickety uh, plant community, a lot of euphorbias and so on. Then the most uh, isolated and, and smallest remnants of habitat in Angola are, are the Afromontane forests. And this is a photograph over the Number Mountains, which has the most forest, Afromontane forest in Angola, which is only 600 hectares. This is Afromontane forest further south down near Lubango. Here, the forest is more restricted to, to just a few of the valleys um, and surrounded by fairly arid savanna, actually. This is down in the southern um, woodlands, the Baikia woodlands, and you get these beautiful grassy drainage lines, um, which become damp when it rains. 
montane grassland also up in the highlands, uh, much more extensive than the forests. Uh, this is up around Lubanga in the south again. This is an amazing tree fern forest in the Number Mountains. Also, I've, I've never seen anything like it anywhere else. Uh, sort of four meter tall tree ferns forming a, a forest canopy. And then most of the plateau is covered in Miombo woodlands, a lot of it fairly stunted, like you see here. And then these broad grassy drainage lines, also called dambos, are, are a very important feature of a lot of the country. And then this is uh, grassland on Kalahari sands, actually right up in the northeast. The, the sands themselves ex extend all the way up to Gabon. So uh, even up in northeast Angola, you get these Kalahari grasslands. Um, it's obviously much higher rainfall, but still deep sands. And then lakes and wetlands are quite an important feature of Angola, primarily along the coastal plains. So you've got these rivers draining out of the highlands going west slowing down and forming big uh, lakes and wetlands on the coastal plain, but this lake is up in the northeast, uh, Lagoa Karumbu. And then one of the habitats which I work in most, although this is a fairly uh, small version of it, the Congo Basin forests. And these come onto the Angolan escarpment and move south along the escarpment for uh, several hundred kilometers. Um, and form outliers. So this is Congo Basin forest, but uh, a fairly species poor form uh, found on the central escarpment. Okay, so that's uh, a general overview of the physical template and, and the habitats. And now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, bird diversity and endemism. Um, Obviously, a lot of this is mirrored in other groups like frogs and, and reptiles and uh, dragonflies and so on, but uh, it's not my area of expertise. And from an ornithological point of view, we actually, we know a lot more than most other groups. Birds are probably the best known group in Angola. Um, so we in a good situation, a relatively good situation. Um, but this is, uh, Angola has a very high species diversity, around 960 species. That's the fifth highest for any African country. Uh, and it also has a lot of endemics. And I, I did, a, in, in my book, uh, The Birders Guide to Africa, I did a, a continent-wide assessment of the importance of different countries based on the birds they hold. And Angola comes out seventh in the region, and you'll notice Madagascar is number one. Um, but so six on the African mainland in terms of bird importance. And now I'm just going to go through a few of the really fantastic, uh, most of these birds are endemic, found only in Angola. Uh, some of the fantastic birds that the country has. And these are also highlighted in a book I wrote, The Birds of Angola, which is available. Well, it's a bird to start with, and Angola's fantastic national bird, red-crested turaco. This is a, an escarpment endemic um, found in the central and northern escarpment. Uh, most of the birds, uh, the endemics are found in the escarpment zone. Uh, a few are confined only to the central or northern escarpment, but most are in both. And this is another one found in central and northern escarpment, gray striped Franklin. This is Montero's bushrike, very similar to gray-headed bushrike, which occurs all, all over the savannas of Africa. Um, the main feature which distinguishes it is this very pale area around the eyes and in the laws. Uh, a fairly drab, near endemic, pale olive green bull, which is associated with the drier thickets at mainly at the base of the escarpment. Uh, the spectacular Gabella helmet shrike, which uh, favors baobab forest, uh, usually at the base of the escarpment. Now coming to some of the more range restricted species. Um, these are, all these birds are endemic, but uh, there are a few which have much smaller ranges. And uh, this is one of the, them. Um, it's the endangered Pulitzer's longbill, found only in the central escarpment forests. 
There are three endangered species only in the central escarpment forest. The second one here is Gabella akalat. And of all the Angolan endemic birds, this has the narrowest range. It occurs in an area of only about 50 kilometers north-south and 10 kilometers east-west. And within that area, it has fairly small pockets of suitable habitat. So another endangered endemic. And then the striking Gabella bush shrike, also endangered. And this is the species uh, probably which I'm most concerned about in Angola. Uh, at Kumbira Forest, where there used to be quite a few, uh, I did uh, 200 point counts in 2010 and found at least 18 territories. I can no longer find any. So in 10 years, we've gone from at least 18 territories to, uh, I haven't searched as extensively, but I've been to all the sites and we're now at zero pairs. So this species has seen an, an alarming decline. There are other sites where it still occurs. Then moving back into the northern escarpment forest, this is the close relative of Gobeta bushrike, but found only in the north, Braun's bushrike. And this is Angolan white-throated greenbull, um, also only, well, it, there are old records from the central escarpment, but currently only known from the northern escarpment. And this is the first photograph ever of the bird in the wild. So a very poorly known species. Now the central escarpment is located quite close to the Angolan highlands and there are few, uh, because of the altitude, there are few species which are shared between them, not many, but this is one and this is the endemic pale-throated barbet, uh, very close related to naked-faced barbet. And it's also gone on a, a, a fairly rapid decline. It's already extinct at Mount Moko. Um, and I've seen a decline in Kumbira Forest. We don't know what's happening in other areas, um, but in the areas we do know it's not doing well. Now moving into the montane areas themselves. This is Angola's rarest bird, um, Suestris Franklin. We estimate there are probably around a thousand pairs left. And at the only site that we've managed to survey extensively, Mount Moko, uh, we, there are about 75 to 80 pairs. Um, it also has a very uh, special place in my heart, this bird. Um, I was the first bird watcher to ever see it. Uh, in 2005, it had only been collected previously. And so this is a very special bird to me. Another highland endemic, um, Angola Slaty flycatcher. And this bird group has a great link to the other, uh, some of the other highland areas of Africa. Um, there are two other Slaty flycatchers. One is found in Ethiopia, and one is found in the mountains of Kenya, Uganda, and Northern Malawi. And then this is the third member of that group, uh, at, at least 2,000 kilometers away from its closest relatives in the Angolan highlands. Striking Margaret's Battus. Uh, this is not an endemic. It is found in Zambia and southern DRC too, but it's, uh, it was first discovered in Angola and the, the montane areas of Angola are, are quite important for its conservation. Then there are a few other species. You, almost everything I mentioned so far is either associated with the hinds or the escarpment, but there are a few other species uh, this is Bokaja's sunbird, which is associated with the plateau as a whole, uh, mainly in the highlands, but it actually spills over just into, into the DRC in the northeast. Uh, fairly widespread, but uncommon across the Angolan plateau. And then uh, this is the last rediscovered Angolan endemic, uh, Angolan white-headed barbet. It also has a very interesting biogeographic link. And, uh, white headed barbet is quite widespread across the northern savannas from Cameroon all the way to Kenya. Um, but this is a, a massive outlier, more than 2,000 kilometers away from the closest birds, which are in central Tanzania. And BirdLife International has just uh, recognized this as an endemic species. Um, and we know it's, it's highly threatened and was only rediscovered by a colleague, actually a herpetologist in 2017. Then one final bird, which has a special place in my heart. This is Brothers Martin. It's a fairly drab little swallow, but before 2005, it was known only from the Congo Basin. 
And uh, I was driving along a little gravel road in the Angolan Highlands in 2005. I heard a strange call coming through my car window. So I stopped the vehicle, got out, and there was a pair of Brothers Martins sitting on some uh, bare grass stalks, singing to each other, um, more than 1,000 kilometers away from they were, where they were ever known. Um, and we now know that the Angolan Highlands are a fairly important area for their breeding. Uh, so that was a, a fun discovery. That's enough about the birds. Uh, there are some endemic mammals, uh, not too many. I don't know much about the smaller mammals, but this also was a fun project that I've been involved with. Um, it's, this is Angola's uh, newest primate species, which I first heard and saw in 2005. I didn't know it was. So I made recordings and sent it to the World Authority, Simon Vieta. And in 2013, I hosted a team of primatologists and we went around studying this uh, little mammal and then described it as a new species to science after that. Uh, this is called Angolan dwarf galago. Okay, so that's a bit about the diversity, especially of birds. Um, moving on now to conservation, I think firstly, it's important to highlight what the protected area network is like in Angola. Uh, the green areas on the maps are on the map is, are, are the protected areas. Unfortunately, these are mostly currently paper parks. Um, there is some management, but there are a lot of issues. So Kisama National Park, located south of Luanda, uh, was proclaimed in the Portuguese era, but during the war, people moved into it. And now only, even though it's a large park, only one quarter of it is currently managed as a reserve. There are large communities living in it. There's oil exploration, um, military bases, everything goes on in there. Um, the other important thing to, to realize is that all these parks, almost all these parks were, pro were proclaimed in the Portuguese era, but they were proclaimed for their large mammals, of which there are few endemics. There is the fantastic uh, giant sable, which is an endemic subspecies of mammal in Angola and the national mammal, um, found in here in number three, Kanganola National Park, and number nine, Luanda District Reserve. Uh, but these parks, because they were um, declared primarily for mammals, they completely miss the endemic biodiversity of Angola. There are no conservation areas which cover any of the northern or central escarpment and none in the highlands. And so pretty much, from a, certainly from a bird point of view, all the endangered endemics are entirely unprotected. Um, so that means that conservation projects outside of current formal protected areas is quite important. Um, there's not a massive amount going on, but I'd just like to highlight a few of the projects. There are others, but these are the ones that have more practical conservation implications. Firstly, um, run by Michel Moraes from the National University. There's some turtle breeding projects working with communities along the coast at Rio Longa and also a second site closer to Luanda, uh, where they've been actually very successful working with communities to protect the breeding areas of the turtles. Then I mentioned the giant sable, um, which is a real conservation success story run by um, Pedro Vas Pinto, who's done a fantastic job uh, working in Kangandala and Luanda reserves. He set up a, a big breeding enclosure. He's actually had to move animals from Luanda into Kangandala and he's finally got them breeding quite well. A large part of the work is also anti-poaching. Lourdes is a, a very remote reserve, but there's a lot of um, uh, poaching, bushmeat trade hunting going on in there. And so he's been fairly successful in employing local communities to act as anti-poaching um, units. Then my own two projects, um, are uh, Mount Moko and Kumbira Forest here, and I'll talk about those a bit more. The reason I chose these sites is their importance for protecting the most threatened habitats currently unprotected. So the montane forests at Mount Moko and the escarpment forests at Kumbira Forest. There are two other very important sites, which um, fortunately are on the government's radar and places that we really would like to get protected. And those are the Number Mountains, 
which have about 80% of the known Afromontane forest in the country, and then some habitat in the northern escarpment forests. Then just to highlight some of the conservation threats before I move on to my own projects. Uh, there's been a great lack of institutional capacity within Angola. Um, I think uh, following a 30 year civil war where the country more or less grinds to a halt, that's inevitable. Um, and obviously conservation was not a massive priority for the country at that point. Uh, things are improving. A great new minister has just been appointed as head of environment. So I think things are gonna improve a lot there. There's also a lack of law enforcement police uh, services don't know what the environmental laws are and they don't enforce them. So bushmeat trade is rampant. And then one thing which I'm beginning to realize more and more, uh, which we don't really speak about much in the conservation arena, is unscrupulous foreigners. People coming in with hidden agendas, um, pretending to do conservation work or using that as a face, but actually making it harder by breaking trust with local people. Um, and making it difficult to do conservation work as, a, as an outsider because, yeah, because trust is broken. Uh, then some of the common things which happen all over the world, commercial logging is a big threat. Um, on the right here is a tree chopped down uh, in big logging areas in the northern escarpment. So a lot of the northern escarpment had very valuable wood resources and that's threatened through commercial logging. Charcoal production is a very big problem in Angola. Uh, most of the country have no other means for cooking other than on wood or charcoal. So this is a commercial endeavor and massive areas, especially of the Miombo woodlands in Angola are being hacked down and converted to charcoal. Uh, uh, subsistence farming, uh, especially in the highlands and the west where people, are, uh, where human densities are higher, uh, are converting a lot of habitat. And here you can see uh, little farms creeping up the mountain sides, um, even onto fairly rocky ground. So they've used a lot of the suitable ground around and, and are moving up to the less suitable now. Slash and burn uh, farming or agriculture is a problem on the central and northern escarpment. Large areas hacked down and burnt to provide fertilizer. And then crops are grown on those soils for three or four years before uh, the nutrients are leached out and they have to move on. And then bushmeat trade is a very big issue, especially in the north of the country. Actually, not only bushmeat, but uh, all uh, resource, uh, natural resources. Uh, I lived in Angola for a few years from 2010. And in 2010, I discovered that in an art market on literally 50 meters out of, off the main road, uh, leaving Luanda, there was ivory being traded completely in the open. Thousands of uh, pieces of ivory on sale to anyone who would come by. Um, so we, we've highlighted these issues. Some of that stopped. Most of it's probably gone underground, but um, there's still a lot of work done on uh, bushmeat trade. Okay, now I'll move on to my own projects. Um, as I mentioned, these are primarily in the most important, or most threatened habitats not covered by the uh, conservation area network. And the first of these is Mount Moko. Uh, this photo on the left taken in 1973 by Brian Huntley and the photo on the right taken by myself in 2016 illustrates quite nicely what's happening here. Basically, we've seen a massive decline in the Afromontane forests, uh, just over 30 or 40 years. Um, and so for this reason and because at the time I started the work, Mount Moko was known to be the most important site in Angola for Afromontane forest. Uh, we started, I started a conservation project here in 2010. Um, this is a view of the mountain. Fortunately, the human situation is quite simple. There's really one village living at the base of the mountain, which is an impact on the forest. And so we've managed to engage the community and work quite closely with them try and uh, alleviate these impacts. This is a satellite image of the mountain. You can see the agriculture in the Miombo belt, luckily on the east, approaching the mountain. And, but the, the montane forests are isolated in these valleys, especially in the center and west, but they're tiny remnants, only 85 hectares of forest left at the mountain. 
Uh, this is the largest forest patch, uh, only 18 hectares in size. And what this photo illustrates quite nicely, actually, is that the main issue currently is fire from grassland. And you can see these brown areas where the fires burn into the forest patches, they're very narrow. Um, and I think what's happened here is that people use the wood from the edge of the forest that altered the forest edge resistance to grassland fires, which can now burn into the forest. And this is currently the greatest threat. Um, this is a, a nice aerial view of the main patch that we actually try to rehabilitate. Um, and so we've started a nursery, which has hidden down some of the trees here. We've now managed to plant uh, 1,700 trees in this area and another valley, trialing our methods. We've, the nursery itself has 1,800 plants on it. And we've been growing this with time. But what I've realized is actually a much more effective way to protect these forests is to prevent fire from burning them. And we started off experimenting by cutting fire breaks. You can see some of the lines on the image around some of the forest patches. And it's working really fantastically, but it's labor intensive. And the next phase we have planned and which we've actually already raised some funds for is to train villagers locally in fire management uh, skills. So they will burn fire breaks every year around the forest patches before the fire season to protect these forests. This is some of the, the work in action, just showing very basic nursery that we have. And this work is all very much, uh, well, it's very important for the local community. It's one of their few sources of employment. And I employ up to 150 people to work with me when I'm there, I'm planting trees, cutting fire breaks, and so on. Another photo from the village. These are ladies coming in in the evening with their, their firewood. Um, and we've engaged the community. So besides planting trees and trying to protect the forest from fire, we, we're trying to instill a greater understanding in the community of the importance of these forests to them. Uh, they're already seeing their water supplies diminished. And the other aspect we're tackling is, is trying to reduce their reliance on natural resources. So we've introduced fully efficient stoves and we have other plans afoot, which will hopefully continue to both assist the community and reduce their impact on the environment. Then the second project site, which I'll, I'll speak less about, um, this is Kumbira Forest. I surveyed uh, 12 different sites along the central escarpment in 2005 and identified Kumbira Forest as the most important site for the conservation of threatened endemic birds, uh, probably in the country. Um, but this area is much more socially complex. There are a lot of human communities living in the area and there's also private and communal land interspersed. Um, it is on the government radar, but until now we've not managed to do anything concrete. Uh, but good news is that the Rainforest Trust has just uh, started supporting the work and we hope within the next two or three years to be able to purchase some land and set up a private reserve to manage for these birds and the other biodiversity in Kumbira Forest. Okay, I think that brings to an end more or less what I have to say. Um, I just, there are a few individuals which I really need to thank, especially Mr. Tassel Leventis, who's been supporting this work for the last 10 years, and then significant funding also from the Rafford Foundation and the Conservation Leadership Program for the two main projects. Thank you.